Hello and welcome to Fight Club. I'm Philip Wegman of The Daily Signal, and today we'll be debating whether or not Justice Anthony Scalia's replacement should be selected on the basis of ideology. Our debaters are Leon Wolf, managing editor of, the, of Red State, and he will be arguing in the affirmative. And then Emily Zanotti, the digital editor of American Spectator, will be presenting the other side. Leon, take it away. Thanks, Philip. I really think that it's important to take ideology into consideration for a very simple reason that applies in the legal field, which is that I believe that most people of literal, liberal ideology do not hold adherence to the, what the actual law says as an important factor to be considered at all. And I'm not a big fan of unilateral disarmament. Let me give you an, an example of exactly what I'm talking about. I myself uh, personally am in favor of gay marriage, but the way that I understand and read the Constitution, I don't believe that a right to gay marriage is contained anywhere in the Constitution. So I, as a conservative, might vote to say, listen, this is something for the legislatures to handle. It's not something for the Supreme Court to declare for the entire country. Liberals, by and large, when you find them on the bench and you run into them at every level of the judiciary, federal and state, tend to make up their minds about what they're going, what they feel the right result will be before they hear the facts of the case and the law is more or less irrelevant to them. Uh, and in fact, that's part of what their ideology says. I mean, if you talk to the intelligent liberals who are on the federal judiciary, people like Stephen Breyer, they say their ideology dictates that the Constitution doesn't have a fixed meaning. It's a meaning that basically is whatever they assign to it within their own uh, belief. And so I believe that it's very important for us as conservatives not to cede this ground and to say, listen, you know, it's okay for the liberals to continue to do this and to interpret the Constitution however they want, and, and we are going to send up essentially, you know, somebody who's going to stick to this strict adherence to the Constitution, you know, to what the law says as though that's something different. To me, having a strict adherence to what the Constitution says is sadly or has become part of what ideologically separates conservatives from liberals. And for that reason, I believe that taking ideology into account is important when selecting Scalia's replacement. So I think that it's actually more important how a person rules rather than what they believe. Because I think ideology can change so much over time. When we talk about the conservative movement, we've seen so many different iterations of it from the 1940s to now. And we really can't pinpoint exactly one set of beliefs that we consider to be our ideology. What's our ideology today isn't going to be our ideology tomorrow. So if you're selecting somebody based on this point in time, things are going to be very different. This is a lifetime appointment. They have to stay there forever. I think Antonin Scalia would say that he would be more concerned finding somebody who was an originalist, somebody who went to the document, went to the Founding Fathers, found out what they wanted to say about the Constitution and what it says and what it means, and then use that to interpret the law, because that is always going to be a static point in history. He believed that what the Founding Fathers wanted when they authored the Constitution was the most important part of interpreting the law even for today. And sometimes that agreed with the conservatives or that agreed with the conservative ideology, and sometimes it didn't. I mean, Scalia was very much you know, on the Commerce Clause, he was very much not a conservative. He was definitely not a libertarian on the Commerce Clause. In, in certain areas, he was definitely opposed to the way things were going, and he felt good about that. He wanted to be the guy in the middle of this rushing river saying that you need to stop and think about what happens. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to find somebody who's really stalwart on that, but I think in terms of what Scalia would have wanted in his legacy on the court, I think that he would really want somebody who tuned out the modern world and went more towards what the Founding Fathers really wanted. So if I could, if I could respond briefly to that, that in and of itself, which I agree with, is an ideological judgment these days. I mean, it, the idea that we need to go back to what the Constitution said at the time and that the power of the federal judiciary is constrained by what the document said at the time is a conservative ideological judgment. I mean, Breyer and Ginsburg openly don't agree with that as a matter of their own personal ideology. I mean, that's, I'm not saying we need to go find people who have the right beliefs about what the marginal tax rate should be, but the whole idea that the Constitution is a fixed document and what the Supreme Court should be ruling on is, is that and ruling upon statutes and the actual words that they say is itself, I think, an ideological judgment that should be taken into account. Leon, so you seem to be arguing that it's impossible to separate ideology from your judicial theory, that you can't separate the 
the being of a jurist from their sort of legal consciousness. Right, I, and if you look at the way that judges approach cases, and this is, you know, everybody, uh, you know, got up in arms with what Justice Sotomayor said about, you know, how she approaches cases and she's got her own life experiences coming into that. She was just being essentially a realist about what all judges do. And I was not as bothered by her comments in that regard because she's being honest. I mean, all judges bring to the bench their own lifelong experiences and set of preconceived ideas. Um, and, and I think it's naive to believe that they can set all those aside. That having been said, I, I agree that what Emily says is important. They should, to the greatest extent possible, set those things aside and just go with, look, look, what's with the text in front of me? What does the statute say? Let's let's focus on those things. Well, Emily, I'd like to get you to respond really quickly. And I want somebody who has a legal theory, not necessarily a political theory. I would actually rather go in front of a judge on the Ninth Circuit who is a dedicated liberal theorist who believes in the First Amendment, who actually will, you know, say, I need to stick to what I believe about the First Amendment, what I believe the First Amendment says, not my political leanings, not where I'm going to vote. So when I come up with, you know, a, a PETA and I come up with an anti-abortion protester, both with very graphic signs, that he doesn't treat them differently because he has a judicial belief or a judicial, not a judicial ideology, but a judicial um, interpretation that's static over years rather than a political idea that this is who I'm going to vote for and who I'm going to vote for dictates how I'm going to rule on a case. So I feel like I would want somebody who is more consistent, more identified with a very particular legal theory than I would somebody who's identified with a very specific you know, who votes Republican and that's all I care about, you know? Emily, you seem to be laying out a very idealistic case where you have sort of a more pr pragmatic approach when it comes to these justices on the court. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, listen, as a, as a guy who's, you know, a, a litigator for seven, eight years, uh, you know, it, it, you become cynical appearing in front of judges for uh, after a certain amount of time. Not only in terms of their ideology, but the you know the the lack of preparation many of them bring to cases and so on and so forth. So from my perspective, I definitely take what Emily is saying to be true, and I would I would be fine appearing in front of a principled liberal who is you know a First Amendment absolutist. But the fact is, it, you find those people just less and less often as you as you go through. Uh, I, I mean, they're rarer and rarer birds, and I think that to to hold out hope that we're going to find you know, something like that and, and put somebody on the SCOTUS who's not going to essentially be a political hack. I, I mean, well, I the wanna, time has changed. I want to you that question, Emily, because you were a student of the justice, isn't that correct? Do you think it's possible to find someone of his caliber to return to the court? I could never find somebody to replace Antonin Scalia. And I think that's the hardest part of this, is he was such a presence, he was such a mind, and he was such a once-in-a-lifetime person to meet that I can't imagine going out there and finding somebody. Now, Janice Rogers Brown is, to me, the person that I would want, but then that's more ideological maybe than originalist. So I, it is a pie in the sky kind of feeling, right? Because I want somebody who's like Scalia, but I, I think we are, the judiciary has become infected with the idea that politics is part of their job. And that's, that's kind of a new thing, and it's gone forward. It's on the liberal side, it's on the conservative side. But I, I don't think we can replace him. However, I think if we're looking for somebody to replace him, we need to find somebody who's very principled, somebody who's gonna be a stalwart, somebody who's not gonna change their mind halfway through, because it's very easy on the court to be influenced by your liberal peers. There's not a lot of conservative support in the legal community, there aren't a lot of people out there who are saying, you know, I want to support an originalist, I want to support a constitutionalist. They don't get a lot of backup all the time. So you want somebody who's really going to stand, stand strong in the face of the modern world. I want to ask you both, what would a court look like if we were to vet justices based purely off of their either pragmatic political concerns or off of their their ju jurisprudence and the more ideal considerations? What in, in, in your mind would that do to the court that we have today? Uh, well, in, in my own cynical view, not much different from how it looks right now. I mean, listen, you know, it, it, it's fine to say that that we, we lament the fact that judges consider politics to be part of their job and that the, the judiciary is an extension of politics by other means, like like war, you know, uh, was, was once said by uh, von Clausewitz. But, you know, the reality is the liberals have crossed that Rubicon and they're not going back. 
I mean, they're not, I, I think that that is just part of, of what the, the liberal judicial philosophy is. And having seen, you know, the evil that can be wreaked by the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court in particular, I, my interest is just not to see them continue to, with no thought or compunction towards honesty, toward the law and, and non-political considerations for us to be the only one who give up that ammunition. I don't know what it would look like. I think it would look very similar to the way it is, but I think you would just see a few justices moved off. Um, I think Ginsburg is a principled jurist, I think. Kagan is a principled jurist. I don't necessarily see that as the same for, say, Sotomayor. So I think it would look very similar, but I think it would be a very different outcome. Well, thank you to our debaters, Leon Wolf of Red State and Emily Zanotti of the American Spectator. I'm Philip Wegman of The Daily Signal. You can vote and let us know what you think.